I've seen Kente. I'm sure by now everybody has seen Kente. Yeah, at, at, at the market. Kente? Yes, K-E-N-T-E. -E. The fabric, right? Yes, the fabric. Kente. You know, it actually comes from the local language. It comes from basket, the weaving of a basket. Um, here, we call baskets Kenteng. Kenteng. You know, it's woven um, either with um, canes or with um, the palm tree, the, 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 the stem or the vine to weave Kenteng, uh, to weave Kenteng baskets. And so there are two stories of how Kente actually came about. There is a myth um, around the story of Kente. Um, one of the myths which is very common and very popular. And even if you search books and you would see and you would read is that it started with um, two brothers who were hunters. They come from the town we are going, Bonri, spelled B-O-N-W-I-R-E, Bonri. And so these brothers were hunters and they went to the forest uh, on their hunting expedition. And during their expedition, expedition, they came across a big spider in the forest, weaving its web. So when they saw it, they were amazed. So again, when they went, they saw the spider again. This time they said, hmm, this might be a sign from the gods. So they had to pay attention closely to what the spider was doing. And so they started learning and trying to see how it was going. So when they came back, they never told anybody. And so they started putting things together. Um, at that time, you could get cotton. Cotton was, was common here. And then to use it, and then other things to use to sew, so to weave. They tie it around the, the toe of your foot, to, and then their hands, and then they pull it and then um, they get it. And then when they finish, they had to present it to their chief. And then their chief at that time also had to present it to the, the king of the Asante, because he is the paramount. And when the king saw it, he said, mm, this is beautiful, it's like weaving a basket. It was like weaving Kenteng. So Kenteng came up and it became very popular. So the first weaving was actually Plain white, plain white, and we had other things coming up like white and black. And the black actually comes from a dye. Uh, they had they had special trees that were used to prepare dye, and we will learn that dye process when we get to Intonso, the Eating Craft Village, how that dye process is, is cutting. And so that's how they. But over the years, um, they have been because of industrialization and stuff. Um, you get. Um, threads, you get all sort of things for um, to be used, materials to be used for kente. Uh, but the traditional colors you would always notice is the colors of the Asantes. Black, gold, green, and you have red also. And all these colors are very, very important. They have meanings. And kente is not just, uh, just a plain fabric, but kente is the political, social, and the way of life of the people in that it represents what the people stand for when a person wears a kente fabric it is a means of communication at that time some of these things were means of communication um, fabrics what you wear how you dress well the way you feel and how you want people to see you when you come out in public so kente at the time was done it was meant only for the royals for chiefs and queens and queen mothers, they were the ones who would wear kente. But over the years, it has become public and everybody can wear it. But then one thing you should know, during a festival, especially in the Asantes, when the festival is up and everybody is allowed to wear kente, but you can't be wearing the same kente the king will be coming in in the public way. If you are found wearing it, yours will be taken away from you. So before the king comes, there are scouts who actually go around and see so the king's kente is always unique. It's always unique. So the people, when they come, they don't know what no. the king's wearing? No, they don't know what the king is wearing. Wow. Yeah. 
And over the years, the the kings, um, anytime they work in tea, they communicate something. Recently, um, one of the powerful ethnic groups in Ghana, and we are the kings, they are chimps and they are santas, were in conflict for over years, like they were not together. Recently, the two empires or two kingdoms came together and the king, the present king, wore a particular king tape cloth, which his predecessor wore, which was a, a, a symbol for peace and unity. So when he wore that to the Deba, he was communicating that. So the kinte fabric has meaning. Anytime you're buying a, a piece of kinte, you would always want to find out what the meaning of the fabric is. Um, the names of the kinte as give, is given to it by the weavers or the master weaver. They give the name of kinte. So in Ghana, for example, there's a particular kinte that was that was sewn or that came up during um, Kwame Nkrumah's time um, when he married to um, the Egyptian woman, Fatia. So the particular kinte called Fatia Fata Nkrumah, which means Fatia deserves Nkrumah. So at the time, you know, people when the, the news came out that Kwame Nkrumah was going to marry an Egyptian woman, everybody was like, why is he going to marry an Egyptian woman? But um, the whole thing, sensitization, was the fact that trying to foster unity, trying to foster oneness. So we are all one people. So it's good that Fatia, indeed, so when Fatia was brought and shown to the, the country, everybody really said, yes, indeed, Fatia deserves in Chroma. And so there was a particular fabric that was sewn. And so it was very popular here in Ghana. Everybody is, is, is very beautiful. And if you ask, if you go to the weaving center, and you ask, you're looking for Fatia, Fatia and Chroma, they will show you. The patterns are, are unique. Uh, these days, they blended so many things, but it still stays the same. And so Kente is woven in three variations or in three types. They have a single woven kente, they have a double woven weaving kente, they have a triple. And all these things are, are unique in that you would you can find the differences how they are woven. No kente is a pattern woven uh, fabric in that uh, the single weaving is just plain and you can just have one or two fabric and designs or patterns. One or two designs or patterns. But the double would have some more colors and more patterns inside and then the triple has so many the, the one of the things to know that it's a triple weaving not a double weaving is that the triple weaving you can't see the background of the kente no you can't see but there's always the background and the background is the initial thread that the, the weaving or the weaver is weaving with so before the kente is set up um, they, they, there's a loom in which the kente is sewn in. The loom, you, you have to work with your hands and your foot. And before that, what the, uh, the weaver is about to start, he needs to get the thread. The thread can be gotten in a comb from the factory, is in a comb, or you could buy it without a comb. But then the work that goes into it is to take it out from the comb and stretch it and then they, they call something laying the wap. They put um, kind of a, a long, they build uh, kind of a, a stand on the other side and on the other side. And then the guy or the person who's about to weave would have to go and tie it round to unravel the thread from the other side to get it. And then when he does it, he needs to lay the wap in that there are designs in which you have to put it Inside. When we get there, you will see it, how it's done. And so when he does that, that first thread that he used is the background. But during the triple weaving, so if it is yellow that he's done with, that's going to be the main thing. But when he's weaving, you actually not see yellow, but you will see different colors. And you will not notice uh, which one did he really start with. Yeah, but for the, for the single and for the double, you actually see that this is the dominant color or thread which was used. So that's the difference, yes. And so um, for that, um, it also determines the price of the kente fabric because more work has to go into um, the weaving. And also before the person weaves, you always have to visualize the thing in his mind. And it's, that's the one, one of the creativity that you always, you can't even understand how they do it. 
Because when the person is weaving, he doesn't have anything to look at. Everything in his mind. And as he weaves, you could see that the design, the pattern is being drawn on the fabric. So even they can actually write your name by weaving. Yes. They can write your name. And it's not like they use a machine to do embroidery on it. No. It's actually hand woving everything. Yeah. So it's it's very, very, very unique. And so Kinte is not only there are now almost most um, other ethnic groups also weave Kinte. Um, if you go to the Volta region, um, they also have their style of Kinte weaving. So when we get to Bonre, you're going to see um, the Kente is going to be a, it's a big center and there's so much Kente that when you get there you'll be overwhelmed. <laughs> yes, you'll be overwhelmed. And so just to let you know, uh, but yeah, but when you get there, if you want to buy some Kente fabric, you can buy uh, from them. You can talk with them, um, chat with them and all that and then um, you, would, you would know. So that's a bit about the kinte. Yes. Is there a, is, is there a such thing as a um, a feminine or masculine? Yes, there is. There is. There is. There is. Um, apart from the material, they use um, cotton. They use silk. They use um, silk, and then there's a metallic thread that I also add. And mostly the metallic thread that they add actually for feminine and um, the female because the women like shiny things. So when the fabric is very shiny, you know, this is uh, for a female uh, thing. And so that's what we think. Yeah. Uh, also, the name of the kente can let you know whether it's masculine or feminine. Yes. Um, yes, colors too. So pink, some bright colors. <laughs> yes, purple, those bright colors, you know that. Yeah. And all these colors will let you know. Yes. So what colors are females? <laughs> pink, purple, depends on the dominant color that you see on the, on, the, on the fabric. You know, pink is a new red in America, and a lot of guys are wearing pink now instead of red. <laughs> Yeah, the European, the European got them in their head. Wearing pink. Yeah, the European got them in their head wearing that pink. And they, and they got them, they fooled their minds by the breast cancer. Mm. They fooled their minds. That's yeah. a good point. By, by the breast cancer with yeah, the pink. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. And now, now the basketball players wear the pink pants, yeah. the, uh, pink shoes, mm. with the breast cancer sporting, or shirts. They style it. Slick, you know. Uh, <laughs> by the breast cancer. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also, if we get there, there's a traditional way we wrap our cloth. Where I don't know if anybody has seen how we put our cloth. Uh, men, um, there's a particular way we wrap our cloth around us. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, uh, mostly, if you're buying a cloth, it's actually for the wrapping for the men, you actually have to buy six yards. Six yards. Wow. Yes and um, you wrap it around yourself and it hangs over. So you have one shoulder um, or that's bare and one side is covered. Either side? Yes, so mostly it is, it is the, the right side, uh, the left side is covered. The left side is bare, yes. Um, here in Asantis, these are the, but in other places they wear a shirt underneath it. That's amongst the others. So to let you know which, <coughs> when someone wraps a, a cloth around you, it will determine where the person is coming from. A typical Asantis will never put a shirt underneath and wear a cloth underneath. They don't do that. The traditional way is to have a, um, a bare um, shoulder, yes, and then have one side covered by the cloth. Yeah. And there are different ways that sometimes they put it on. There are ways you can put it on and then the cloth is short, there are ways you can put it when the cloth is long. And there are other ways that you can even wrap it around your your neck, tie. And even the way you put it on here can let, can determine what kind of pressing, what kind of role you play. And also the way that you wrap it on, the, on, on their waist and then they have their bare 
um, the upper body exposed. So yes, we are driving past uh, Kwame Nkrumah University. So it goes over the left. The left. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is there significant that the shoulder goes over? There, there, there should be a significant. I don't know. <laughs> yes, there is. Because and no, for mostly um, for the female, they put it. They have. They, they use three pieces. Three pieces. There is one that they would wrap over, but then first they have to cover the uh, breast side and all the way and then they have one that will cover their waist and then they will have one that they will just put it over their shoulder so three pieces and then for queen mothers they have one that they will tie a, a kind of a, a scarf type over kind of a belt that's only grandmothers for queen mothers for queen mothers yes queen mothers yes and then they, that so that's some of the ways that they do it so when do you determine when someone is a queen mother? Yes. How do you determine? Yes, is it, is, it, is it the age or is it the status? Or is it both or? Okay, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, talking about that, you have to understand the chieftaincy system in Ghana. In that, um, in Ghana, uh, amongst the Akans, who are predominant, they inherit, they have an inheritance system. They inherit from the matrilineal system or they inherit from the mother's side. So we have two systems. We have the patrilineal system, that's those who inherit from their father's side. And we have matrilineal system, those who inherit from their mother's side. And amongst the Akans, the majority of Ghanaians inherit from their mother's side. So one, um, talk about the queen mothers. The queen mother, um, before a person becomes a queen mother, that person should be coming from a royal family. That's the number one thing, becoming from a royal family. And the person who can become a royal family can be a young person, but most often that young person would have to uh, be a project, for, uh, how do you say, uh, an understudy, an elderly person to get to a particular age. And um, mostly you have people at a particular age which they would use as queen mothers because you would, it's believed that as you grow, you get wisdom, you get understanding, your mind open and all that. Because the role of a queen mother is very, very important. In that, if, again, if uh, a chief dies or a chief is overthrown, it's the responsibility of the queen mother to nominate the next successor. Yes. Not nominate, not select. No. Just yes, she nominates and is presented to the king's men. And then the king's men will have to verify that the nomination is right. So in the matrilineal system, let's take it. In the matrilineal system, if my mother is a queen mother, I can become a chief. My my mother's sisters, children, sons can become a chief. But if my father is a chief in the matrilineal system, I can never go near to become a chief. If your father is a chief, you can't be a no, chief? No, I can't. Why? Because it's a mother's thing. It's a mother's thing, mother's sister's thing. Oh. <laughs> you understand? She brought you into the world. So it has to be the son of a mother. Of one yes, so even if I become a chief, my sons cannot become chiefs. But if I become a chief, right. it is my nieces and my nephews who can become chiefs and queen mothers. Because right. you're a man. Yes. Yeah. So it's my sister's See, children. children. Right. So here we say the power belongs to the women. See, that's what I like. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the great system. That's, that's, that's just democracy. Yes. 
you don't, if you are a bad chief, yeah. you can't pass it on to your son. Exactly. And so then it will skip okay. and give the opportunity for someone else. So do you know one thing? Before a grandmother nominates somebody within the family, so when a, when a stool is vacant, either the, the chief has been overthrown or the chief is dead, what happens is all the sisters and the grandmother who is responsible, she gathers all the sisters and they meet and then they will nominate amongst them. But they have to look at certain things because the kinmakers would have to look at certain things as well. So they will also have to look at certain things. And before the person is brought out to the public, the person should be somebody, the village or the community will all accept. So there are things that they look at criteria. One, the person should be a respectable person. Two, the person should have contributed to the community. Three, the person, which is very, very important. Three, the person should not be a drunkard. <laughs> what if he becomes a drunkard after he becomes king? So that's different. So that's, that person, if the people don't like it, they can overthrow him. See, that's what I'm talking about. So the next one is the person shouldn't have any strange sicknesses or diseases and should be whole. It shouldn't have be amputated, a broken up. But if the person become a chief and go is, is has an accident, he can still be there. But you have an assistant. Yeah. And so they look at these things. And also the final thing is the person should not be a woman either. Mm, I was wondering, yeah. Because yes. When you become a chief, you can marry as many women you want, but you can't be taking other people's wives. Not good, not good. It's not accepted. It's not accepted at all. So these are the things that they will look into. When you can have as many wives as Yes. Same thing. Yeah. No. No, you can't take somebody else's wife. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, so when it's verified by the king makers and it's gone, they present it to the people. The people also have a say. In that, in the person they are bringing, and they realize that there is something wrong about the person. They would reject it. The kingmakers would have to go back to the queen mother for the queen mother to bring another selection. So that's how it's done. So they find a better suit for the person. So that's how it's done. And sometimes um, it takes a while before that person is brought out, is brought out to the public. Because, for example, when a chief dies, it can take a long time before the, the burial is done. Because right after the burial, the next thing that they have to do is to be swearing in a new chief. So they can't just bury the dead and then put in a new chief. They need to take process to uh, make sure that when the chief dies, there's a successor and all that. But the women and the, the village and the kinmakers and the people are very wise in that. At a certain age, they start grooming somebody who is likely they would want to be the next person. Yeah. So all these things. So for example, a typical one I spoke to you about, the founder of the Asante people, was said to do, his uncle had to send him to go and learn and study at a place. And so that's how it's done. So before it gets there, it becomes. So that's the way. And also, it's opposite. When the queen mother dies, it is the chief who have to nominate the queen mother. But he has to look within the family to choose. And I was telling you that in Ghana, the kings don't, the kings don't um, rule their reign. Um, and when they reign, they are not ruling in a dictatorship manner. Because one of the things that they can do, the people can do, because the power belongs to the people in that. When the people feel that the chief is becoming a dictator, they can overthrow the chief. And this is how they do it. Once the chief is in public, and the people take your sandals or what you're wearing out of your legs or your foot, it means you've been overthrown. Take your foot? Yes. Take your shoes. Shoes. Oh. <laughs> your legs, it means you've been overthrown. They don't like you. Yeah. Who will be in charge of your Take them shoes. The people, they agree and then they come and they do that. So it is a, it is a taboo for a chief to walk barefooted. Yes. 
Posey tell you don't touch me? You snatching me home. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it would have it would have built to a certain level for the people to do that. Okay, that's so funny. Also, one of the things is the chief is very powerful in that nobody can rebuke the chief in public except the Queen Mother. Because the Queen Mother can be the mother and is the mother of the chief. It's only the mother who abused the child. And so because the chief is powerful, you need to be careful. So when the people have a problem, they would go to the Queen Mother. Queen Mother, talk to your son. That's power. That's, 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 that's way better than democracy. That's way better. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. So when the queen mother is not paying attention and the, the king is not paying attention, the people will react. That's yeah. how it's done. Yeah. So because it like on Shaka Zulu, he made his mother the, the, the queen mother, right? Yeah. Put her in that position. Yeah. Yeah. So the queen mothers are very very powerful. Um. So, and also, again, to help in the governance of the community, the, the chief or the king rules with elders. And so anytime he sits in council, there are people who are always with him. So one of the things is, even to go to the court uh, of a chief, that's the courtyard or the palace, there are people who play different roles in the palace. Before you see a chief, you have to follow certain protocols. And um, before, for example, back then, when somebody is coming to a town or a village, you need to send message that you are coming there. And whatever your mission, you need to let the people know. But when you come, the first point of uh, contact, you have to go to the chief's palace. And before you get, you go there, you have to take in certain, you have to take in there certain things, uh, shnab. Uh, as a gift and then you sit down and there the chief, is, the chief comes but there's somebody who's very important there is someone who we call the linguist the linguist here you know the chief has the has is an is embodiment of the ancestors the gods and the people so when he sits in council he don't speak directly to the chief you speak through the linguist. The linguist also speaks to you. And so you talk to the linguist. The linguist lets the chief know that I want, I want I have come here, I will do this, 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 and that. And then the chief will speak. Even though when the chief speaks, you are you, you can hear the language. The chief will speak it through the linguist and the linguist speaks to you. Because in that, the chief language is supposed to be um, powerful and so he would speak in proverbs and most often the chiefs and the linguists and the people will always speak in proverbs and sometimes the chief maybe by maybe by maybe because of the number of wives he had slept somewhere and didn't wake up very good mm -hmm. and so he might speak out of um, what he's supposed to say something that he's not supposed to say the responsibility of the linguist is supposed to make sure that the words of the chief are refined so that when there's a problem, you don't go out and tell people that this is what the chief said. You say this is what the linguist said, that the chief said. So it's always <laughs> go to the linguist first. <laughs> you understand? So that is how it is done. So all these things, and also in, 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 in public places, there are people who protect the chief. And there are so many things that protect the chief. They are charms, amulets, because even you would you would say oh, the chief is powerful, but still, you know, the belief in in the unknown is there. <laughs>